You know, I can argue with them about some misconceptions they have at the core of what they've been kind of sort of taught. Mm -hmm. But their goal is to find equality. And so that's absolutely fine. No one's arguing yeah. that. I think the question you ask if somebody comes up and says, look, I'm a feminist. Why do you object to me? I ask a simple question. I say, do you believe that we all need to fight for equality for women? Yes or no. Or do you believe that all women are innocent victims of men's violence? because they are men are part of the patriarchy if they say yes to that then they're radical feminists right right and yeah the, you know the reason i think that what you have to offer when you talk about uh these issues is that you have personal experience and you have an understanding not just from seeing it from a distance you've you've actually interacted with it over the years you've watched it kind of go I from work, yeah i work with both men women and children both yeah. victims and people who are designated as perpetrators and very often aren't. So I was listening to you talk one day and I remember you're talking about uh, that you were helping set up these shelters and I thought, yeah, you know, I've never known a world without that. But what you see the tragedy from the very beginning is recognizing as I did that it wasn't a gender issue and men were also victims. When I tried to set up a men's house, I actually got a physical building, but none of the men who were millionaires in my early experience with the work shelters, none of them would give me a penny for men. And everybody's found this anywhere where they're trying to set up shelters, whether it's America or Australia or New Zealand, when it comes to a place for men, nobody wants to know. Wow. This is like... You set up for women, people reach out in compassion. Sure, yeah. And then if you do it for men, is it kind of like a thing where they're like, well, those men must be weak or they deny that it exists, yeah. the problem? It's how men think about men. The only time you actually get traction is when it's happened to them. And then they suddenly realize. But by that time, they're usually homeless and penniless. And I noticed in Canada, if a man couldn't pay his child support, which often they can't by the time they've been ruined, they go to jail, they lose their passports, they lose their driving license. It's a tragedy. Now, when you when you first started setting up uh, these shelters, um, was there a time that um, many feminists maybe uh, started using your name in a positive way before they decided to? No, no, no. It was, it was a fight straight off because I had, when I opened the first shelter, there was nothing in the world. There was no recognized place. And those for women to come to with children who would take them in and fight the battle. I was the first. And I knew, and this is the frightening thing, having been thrown out by the whole feminist movement, I knew that once the whole story broke and the idea that, yes, domestic violence is happening behind front doors, and there was any uh, uh, media attention and money that they, I, the feminists would come, and they did. I had uh, three years from 71 to 74. By 74, they had realized that now they had, uh, just cause violence towards women and they also had uh, funding and it's become a billion dollar industry and slowly as these as the movement grew and more and more f radical feminists came in uh, uh, the harder it came for men to have any any sense of justice oh that's you know so it's, a, it's, a, it's like a, a fight for control a fight for the the public dialogue well, no, because it isn't, it, isn't, it isn't a fight in a way, it's a pushover because there isn't any dialogue in Canada. There are men's, trying to, men's groups, there are men trying to get justice and shelters and women helping with them. There's a huge amount of women who understand exactly what we're saying. But I don't know the setup with your government, but certainly in our country, the women's minister, and she's been minister for quite a while, and she's also <laughs> leader of the, of, the lab, of the shadow cabinet, the Labour leader. Uh, Harriet Harman has publicly said in 1990 that men are not necessarily harmonious to family life. And Patricia Hewitt and other our members of parliament said, yes, we need men in primary schools, but men can't be trusted with children. I mean, this is the attitude coming from our governments. Just recently, our prime minister, David Cameron, lauded the role of single parent mothers and said and called all 
other men feckless fathers. No understanding that the majority of men are not feckless, they are banned and barred from their families. Well, first start, I'm banned from any feminist conferences, right? I'm banned from even going up the steps of my own refuge, because it's run by a radical feminist. So all the refuges, virtually all, except perhaps a handful, are actually run by uh, feminists in the National Federation, or whether it's the other ones called Refuge. And those, basically, no men are allowed to work in the refuges. Boys over 12, or sometimes 9, aren't allowed in. Mothers have to make other arrangements for them. No men can... It's it's a feminist, I, whatever. And it's been a massive fraud. It's been a, a multi-million pound fraud across the Western world because the premise that all men, are vi uh, all women are victims of men's violence is proven internationally in all the research, all the studies, that it's not a gender issue, it's a family issue. Right. So it's now a question of a tipping point coming. And when we are there now, a couple of years ago, I was in a, a huge festival here called WOW, Women of the World. And it happens on... Um, uh, you know, Women's Day in Mar on March the 8th. And I went up to speak and I was asked to speak and it was a room packed with women, people standing outside, people stand up against the walls. And the most exciting thing for me was normally I would be attacked at least by half the room. This time there was a complete understanding that when I finished speaking and said, until men and women come together to work on problems of family violence, nothing is going to change. And these much younger women all stood up for that. So when I'm speaking now, I don't get picketed, I don't get screamed at. People listen. And I, on Friday, I was with a group of social workers who all absolutely understood what I was saying. And in fact, they had many of them been working with men in social services situations. So it is changing. Uh, I'm glad about that. Yeah. Oh, it's about time too, though. <laughs> yeah. This is no longer about trying to make a statement or a political change. This is about intimidation. So, yeah. yes, I mean, I, I had it for years and years and years, and everybody involved. In fact, Mary Strauss, and Richard Gellis, and Susan Steinmetz were the first uh, researchers in America, and I was actually invited out there to meet them. And this is before any research had been done. And they very bravely, believing what they had, had heard, which is this is what happens to women, began to do the research and very quickly realized exactly what I'd said, that it's not a, a gender issue. And they said so, and they started to produce their research. And they had, like I did, they had bomb threats and threats. Susan's family was threatened, and it went on for years and years. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's extremely difficult when it's that vicious. But you have to remember, it's vicious because it's about funding and money. Yes. It was now, never, ever about women who are victims. What you said before stunned me that, that these are the, you're, what you're saying is the shelters that you started. Yeah. You're no longer allowed in those shelters. No, no. In fact, I had a letter last year from my own refuge, which, is, which was called Chiswick uh, Women's Aid. And they call themselves Refuge. And when I refer to myself as the founder of the refuge movement, they've asked me not to use the word refuge because they don't want to be associated with what I have to say. Uh, what is their excuse for a stance like that? That they think that you are a threat of some kind? Yeah. Yes, because they know that I know they're lying. But there's been one huge, massive, nearly 50-year-old lie uh, that, that all men are, uh, are, are perpetrators and all women are victims. It's, it's never been true, ever. And that's very threatening when you've got, you know, when your huge salaries and vast offices given over to the ideology of some very sick women, as far as I'm concerned. The social worker who does this work all the time put her pen down and looked at me and she goes, Corey, why the hell did you stay there so long? Yeah, good and question. It was a real moment of, of, I felt really ashamed, though. I was like, the only thing I can, I can think to tell you is that when you're in that situation, you're just trying to hold your family together. You're not clear on what's happening. Yeah. Like, looking back, clearly, I can see what you're saying. Like, now I know. Mm -hmm. But at the time, you're try you're doing it out of love, right? You're trying to hold it all together. And also, you're trying to make it better. Particularly men, they will they will try and try and try. Yeah. And, uh, and, um, and the, the feeling that you if you can't make her better, then you're the failure. And for a long time, an awful lot of men think it's all their fault anyway. Yeah, well... A lot of the time it's just talking to people who are confused because they see their partner who is violent and manipulative 
and they don't realize there is a mask of sanity there that's there for a time and then the mask comes off and i think for me like i say it was also that it deteriorated over time mm -hmm. it does yeah and also because you see one of the things about violent people there's always the honeymoon periods because yeah. they know how to play that game extremely well cheese wick women's aid archive circa 1970s Number two, Belmont Terrace, a short-life property, was leased to Chiswick Women's Aid by Hounslow Council as a community centre for women. The women did most of the decorating themselves. Erin Pitsey, who started the centre, had originally seen it just as a place where women could come to sit and chat. One room was used as a playgroup, another served as a discussion place, where the women could sit and talk over their problems. And then it was at that time when this woman came in and just took her jersey off and showed us these appalling bruises and her breasts were just like sort of bowls of blue jelly and said that her husband had beaten her very badly and no one would help her. And she was standing in front of me and I knew what she meant. And it was very shattering for me because I'd believed that I was an isolated person within my own childhood experience. and that. There was help and provision, because I believed in the social services and all the various other institutions. Um, so when she said, nobody will help me, I knew what she meant, and I said, you'd better stay. And she stayed. As the word spread locally, women started to come in. They just came to the doorstep with their children and said, please let me in, no one will help. And we began to build up this dossier of terrible, relentless, uncaring on the, on the part of all the services in the country. Nobody seemed to be doing anything constructive to help. They just seemed to be sending these women back to the men who beat them, and some back to be killed. The open-door policy of Chiswick Women's Aid meant that, on average, some 40 women and children were staying in the four-roomed house at any one time. After 18 months, the house was due for demolition. most important thing out of all this and everything that we've been saying is more and more people need to stand up and be counted. Yes. Because these women can only get away with it when it's in secret and they can pursue the people they see as their prey, which largely, unfortunately, is right the way across universities in the Western world, because that's the feeding ground where they brainwash the young female students and men, male sometimes, young female students into this uh, uh, this 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 realization that all men are incredibly dangerous, and uh, and there are factories now. Really, many of the universities, and the, the many of things tragedies that for many of the young girls, it takes years for them to realize that it has been a completely abnormal uh, existence that they have been offered. And uh, you know, I guess I would say uh, in the end, how what good is it to replace one set of victims with another? Um, if if people really want to address concerns that are particular to women, uh, they they can't do it in isolation, and they can't go about it dishonestly. Like I, I think most people are willing to have the discussion, but once you start demonizing the other sex in favor of one sex, you're just tipping the balance to to cause the very problems that you've been saying that you're against. Again, yes, I understand that, um, but I suppose. Young girls are very vulnerable, particularly if they have had violent fathers, and they're often the ones that are most likely to be brainwashed successfully and then move on to become totally radicalized against men because then the idea that the family is a dangerous place for women makes sense to them. This is their core belief because that is what happened to them as children. Yeah. You know, and instead of being able to recognize that in, in domestic... One of the things that made me compassionate towards my mother and father was knowing their history. And thinking to myself, no wonder she was as she was, because she was absolutely hated by her stepmother and very bad abused. And the same with my father. Interestingly enough, it was his mother, uh, because by the time the 17th child had come along, she had no time for him. And so my feeling is that, that it's, it's extremely important that now, particularly with the situation as it is, with uh, Hillary Clinton now trying to make the Violence Against Women Act to go global, uh, if she gets in, that we really seriously need to, to recruit more people, and particularly men, 
stand yeah. up be counted because it's all very well as long as they keep their heads down they'll be fine until by accident they get involved with... it's it's too often that people wait till they are personally affected like i say i should have been more critical of these things well before and it, you know i even knew people who had been affected but it's convenient to just ignore it until it comes for you but particularly also you know men are from when they're tiny taught to believe that their mothers uh, and to put women on pedestals, and it's that's often fathers. You know, I always remember most fathers will say when there's an upset in the family, "What did you do?" He says to the children to upset your mother, yeah. which is very very confusing for a child because often the child is completely innocent. It's the mother who has has wreaked some kind of vengeance on the child. So the child is brought up to think of themselves if they criticize their mother that somehow it's their fault, whatever she does. You know, and they were the worst because they were the first and they were the ones that brainwashed their daughters and had their sons and on down. But there is the whole new generation coming up who are now pro probably in their 30s and coming up for 40s, who, although they've heard all this, have been far enough away from it to stay rational. And so my feeling is, hopefully, as they flood into the, the, you know, into the, the various agencies, that the climate will change and it'll change for the better and men and women will be seen for what they really are. And also, I hope, will bring to the whole discussion of how we handle taking care of, of mothers, fathers and children to look at generational family violence and the understanding of how if a mother is brought up by, like I was, by a narcissistic exhibitionist, then there are certain things that need to happen for that child so they don't repeat the pattern. Change, changing that cycle of uh, a disturbed family behavior. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And and it can be changed because that's why in my projects, some of the women stayed in the projects for up to four or five years because the brain is plastic. The brain can always change. The younger you have the child, the easier it is for the child to change. But even in much, much later, you can change. and You can change the way your brain thinks and absorbs information. Well, they could have a look at my website. Um, that's uh, that's erinpitsy.com. Okay, I'll also put a link, like I say, in the show notes. Yeah, and also to the book, uh, This Way to the Revolution, because that really gives you the whole histories laid out there. Yeah, I'm going to get myself a copy of that. <laughs> okay, because people don't realize the history, you see. They don't know that it was never a, a women's movement. It was always, as it always has been, you know, it was essentially uh, a Marxist movement, a feminist Marxist movement to create jobs for the girls, and they'd be awfully successful if you think about it. Well, probably the only reason I so quickly understood what you're talking about when I heard you make that reference, uh, I think probably on AVFM at some point, was because uh, I had listened to that multi-hour program um, going through and identifying how we are all prone to get involved in ideology until we start identifying the problems with ideology itself. Yes, that's right. Yeah, extraordinary. You're giving away what's most precious in your own society, and you're giving it away without a fight, and you're even praising the people who want to deny you the right to resist it. Shame on you while you do this. Make the best use of the time you've got left. This is really serious.